Well, it's been a great week, yeah. For those of you who don't know, uh, if you're, maybe this is your first time here or you haven't been in a few weeks, this year, uh, as it, last year, we set aside a week to do a mission project here in Sarasota. Only because there are so many of us, we needed more than one project because we'd get in each other's way. So literally, we planned up front 32 different mission projects, mission trips to Sarasota this past week. Some were one-day trips and one, some were five-day trips, and they were just, but they were all within the context of our, our community. And our desire was to serve the people in our community. So he did a lot of different things, and you just saw the pictures on the screen there of many of the different events we had. And we, we had a luncheon for widows, and we just wanted to bless them and let them know how valued and valuable they are to God, and, and we provided a lunch for them, and, and they got to hear some ladies speak, and, and, and then we had a, 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 we had a luncheon for veterans, and I met a 92-year-old man who was at Iwo Jima, and he was telling me his story. I mean, we just wanted to honor our veterans. And there were just lots of that. It's, the week started for me uh, with a prayer walk uh, at one of our schools. And maybe there'll be somebody who want to share a little bit about that with you. But, um, but right after that, I mean, I, I met my, uh, the uh, middle school girls that went to an assisted living facility to sponsor a Valentine party for all the residents. And so they made cakes and cupcakes and goodies and all kinds of stuff. And they met there and they put together the whole program. We were talking about our middle school girls were singing and then mingling, talking to them. And it was just an amazing time. Just they ministered to folks that many of them, they don't have any idea who they are. But they did it. I mean, there's just, uh, you saw pictures of people going to the National Cemetery to, to clean the tombstones because they get all kinds of filth all over them throughout the course of birds flying over, you name it. So we're there to clean them all. Our folks loved it. But they, we had folks go to the Salvation Army uh, to help prepare the food and, and also to serve the food. I mean, there was just lots going on. Well, before I, before I jump on that, because I want you to see just how biblical that is, what I want to do is this. I want to give you a chance. If you were part of any one of those 32, or I think there may be two or three that weren't even listed originally, so there might be 35, but if you were a part of any of those projects, I want you to raise your hand. All right, keep them up, keep them up, look around. Man, this is amazing. Let's give them a big old hand, all right? Let's do that. Good job. I, I don't have the numbers of how many people actually were involved. I know that uh, we had two numbers up front. And, and before they actually began, there were something like 370 people who had volunteered to do different things, but some of those were duplicates. So I, but then I, I asked them to check on that, and at that time, there was like 280 people, no duplicates, of people who were already committed. This is about a week before the actual event had happened. So my guess is there were a few others. There were people that showed up for these events that didn't sign up. But what's important is that the church itself felt really convicted that we ought to serve our community. They did. Now, here's what I want you to do. I, I have a microphone here. It's a dangerous thing. But I'm going to hold this microphone. And I, I would like, and maybe some of you were on one of these trips and, you, and you know, God just spoke to you or showed you something you never would have dreamed. I mean, and maybe something you just said, wow, I would have never thought. And it, how did God use it in your life? All right, you have 30 seconds or less to share that. So I'm going to walk over here and don't everybody, look, everybody's turning away from me, you know. Uh, we're going to come right over here. Here we go. Um, yesterday Tell me your did, name first. Oh, Janice Sakley. And uh, yesterday we did a uh, prayer walk at Brookside Middle School. It was my group. And um, our son-in-law, our daughter, little baby. And um, some other ladies from the church came. And we weren't allowed to go into the center of the building. Uh, we had to go around the perimeter. But as we walked around, um, praying God's spirit there, letting him know he was welcome there. Um, and we prayed over things like the golf carts and the people who drive those around because they deal with the students that are trying to leave the campus or might be causing trouble, and we prayed for them. We just prayed that those people would feel a difference when they came back to school on Tuesday. And we realized amongst ourselves when we discussed it afterwards that as we prayed God's spirit down on that building, it didn't matter that we couldn't go to the center because Satan's not going to have a stronghold there because God's spirit was all around the outside. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that good? Let's give her a hand. Who else? Who else? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to make somebody. <laughs> this is my wife, Cindy. <laughs> Here you are. 
Well, I'm really proud of my girls, I'll just say. I took 13 middle school girls, went to the assisted living facility, and you know, they didn't know anyone that was there. And so it's kind of awkward, you know, sometimes meeting people, but I have never been proud of my girls because they were just right there with them. In fact, when we got ready to leave, some of the uh, residents gave them their phone number <laughs> to come back. I think um, they loved them. They, my girls loved on them. They sang. They talked about Jesus, and I was just um, blown out of the water by how very kind they were. And my girls asked if they could go back the next day. That would have been last Sunday. I said no. <laughs> but I love that they love that. Thank you, hon. Yeah, give her a hand. Isn't this great? All right. Hi, I'm Cheryl Hewton. Um, I had the honor of taking at least 40 of us to the Salvation Army. And I've never been so blessed in all my life, um, including pastor who stayed two extra hours, and the staff there just raved about how we served, and, and we've reflected well. We were great ambassadors for the Lord. And we definitely impacted the Salvation Army. Mm. And, and it was a blessing. We went to be the blessers, but we got blessed. That's We're, right. It was great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marilyn Alston. I just want to say about the Salvation Army, we are so blessed to have that Salvation Army yes, Center are. here in Sarasota. And they can use any one of you, lunch, dinner, whatever. But the residents there, are awesome. I made new friends. It's just like overwhelming. It's wonderful. Kind Thank of break, you, Lord. It breaks your heart when you see that they have so little and they're so grateful for what we, we do. It's, it was amazing. Amazing. Somebody else? Can I squeeze by you here a minute? Here we go. Hi, I'm Teresa B. Zach. I'm a new member. Um, last night with Brother Dave and Sister Susanna, we watched the kids for, I think there were 50 or so kids. What a blessing for those children who had so much fun and wore me out. But the point was, <laughs> there was two little kids, had no idea who they were, Lydia and Owen, which now I know who they are. <laughs> I don't see the path. I can't even think of with them. Yeah, right. Jared and Cindy Wyndham. Yeah, that's so their kids. Sweet. And Lydia was missing her. Is it Lydia? Yeah. She's missing her mother, so she let me hold her. She wanted me to hold her. I saw I'll be your mom for a minute, but the point was, I think we, we got to sing songs. Pastor Dave was so smart. Brother Dave, we'll call him both. He said, let's sing songs. And I, he's right. You don't know. Now, Lydia and Owen are obviously <laughs> well seasoned in the Lord, but we don't we ever know. It was really special for me, and I want to do it again. So. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow. You know what that was? You know, our young married uh, couples in our community, they're about wore out from taking care of kids the whole day and working two and three jobs and all that. So what we did was we decided to have an event where one class in particular took it, but said, we're going to take care of all their kids for a couple hours so they can go out on a date. And that's what we did, and that's what she's talking about there. Oh, okay. I'm Lisa Lakovaleski, and I was just amazed at what God did on the luncheon, and when people come together and are willing to serve like a mighty army, and how God shows up, and women uh, receive Christ that day, and it was a real blessing. It was. It sure was. Give her a hand. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Dave Swenson, and I'm an entertainer and an evangelist. I play the piano, and I go into assisted living homes, and I share the gospel and also entertain them with my piano talent. Uh, what was amazing is I did a concert on Friday night, and uh, my wife and I, we've had friends uh, that are of the Jewish faith for many, many years. We love these folks with all of our hearts, and Friday I got to share the gospel with them. Um, and I also had other friends as well that I work with. But, um, you know, it's, it's all about souls, and sharing the gospel, and, you know, this life is not the end, folks. To have an afterlife. So it was just a wonderful opportunity. I know they now have heard the gospel, and I'm so excited that that seed I know for sure has been planted. Hopefully, it reaps a harvest. We'll see. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Dave. That was good. Hold on, I'll be back. Dwight Bledsoe, 
I was out at the cemetery helping to clean the tops of the, the markers. And as I got to my brother's marker, there was a lady two rows up and about three graves down, and her shoulder, she had her head bowed, and her shoulders were shaking, so I knew she was weeping. So I eased over and asked her if it was a loved one. She said, yes, my husband. I said, well, when did he go? And she said, last June. I said, well, tell me about William. And she said, Bill. I said, okay, tell me about Bill. So she shared with me their life together and all, and I said, well, when I come out to visit my brother, I will come over and talk to Bill. And she came back over to my brother's grave and tell me about Ed, and I told her, and she said, well, I'll do this thing. Wow. So it was a God thing. It sure was. And I did find out that she was a Christian, and we're going to have a reunion one day. Amen. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you, Dwight. My name is Barbara Murphy, and I was a hostess on Monday for the Widows and Singles Luncheon. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit with a group of our own widows here from the church. We need to remember our widows. They're alone. They're lonely sometimes. And so I had the opportunity to just love on them and talk to them. It was a blessing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marian Ellis, and I am a very proud American. And I was honored to clean the graves yesterday for all the people that helped me be here. And thank you very much. And bless you. That's my mom. Um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the church as a whole because I got to be ministered to on Wednesday at the blast, and so did my son in law and my grandchildren. We just enjoyed it so much, and the best part was everything was free. We didn't spend a dollar, and we had so much fun, and everyone was so kind and so loving. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Wow. Let me squeeze by here for just a minute. Here. The mic is a, is a dangerous thing. Yes. Now, I wasn't here last week. But I just wanted the congregation. I just wanted the congregation Here, this. to Go ahead. Um, to meet someone that all of you have prayed for so long. And I want you to meet my sister, Jan. And the Lord cured her of pancreatic cancer. Praise Lord! And oh wow! This is great. It is. I'm healed. Let me tell you. <laughs> and all of you have prayed for her for so long, and I thank you all so much. Thank you. I thank you too. I thank you too. Is God good or what? Huh? He does. He's amazing. All right. I'm walking. Um, I want to preach. <laughs> Actually, there are so many stories that could be shared at this time. Uh, every one of you that had a part to do, you have a story. Some people were so surprised at what they encountered. They thought, all right, I'm taking some time off to do this one thing. I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do. But then they did it, and they realized they were the ones that received the blessing. You know, they thought they're the ones doing it. And that's just how it works. It's amazing to me. I mean, and oftentimes, you know, when we go on mission trips overseas or outside of our Sarasota area, we do what we, what we did this week. And one of the reasons why we do this week the way we do it is we want you to know that if you decide to go to Cuba or you decide to go to Quebec City or you decide to go to China or on any one of our numbers of trips, you need to know that that's the kind of thing that we do there. We're there to develop relationships. We're there to serve people. And as God opens up doors for us to share the good news of Christ, we do that. I mean, that's just what it is. And that's what we're to be about while we're here on this earth, which, which really brings me to what I want to share with you this morning. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the, the Gospel of Matthew. Na Matthew chapter 9. And it's, it's really at the end of this chapter that I want to read, but, but it, we need to understand these three or four verses in light of what took place all through this last chapter in the life of Jesus. So let me just read to you this, um, this passage in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And what you're going to find is that Jesus models the kind of lifestyle that you just demonstrated this last week. And, and I've, I've called this lifestyle missional. 
It's a word that was coined back in the 90s, and a lot of people talk about it. And it's a word that describes someone who knows why they're here, and they're all about it. They're doing it. That's what it means to be missional. Jesus was missional. He knew what he was here for, and that's what he focused on. He was resolutely focused on doing what he was here to do. And, and God wants us to follow him. Remember, Jesus, when he offers the invitation to all the disciples, he says, you, come and do what? Follow me. Well, if you follow Jesus, what are you going to end up doing? You're going to end up living a missional life. And, and I whet your appetite on this whole subject matter uh, a few weeks ago, maybe back in uh, November or December, because the, the, the letter of 3 John in your New Testament is all about the missional lifestyle. But, but this time we're going to look at it through the eyes, the lens of Jesus. And I want you to know, I want you to see specifically what he did, why he did it, all of those things, because it'll help you as you walk out the door to be missional as a lifestyle. And that's what ultimately God wants. He doesn't want us just to reserve one week out of the year for us to be missional. He wants it to be one of those things that, can, that literally describes our lives daily. So Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, and that's so important because you can do all these things without seeing. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, this is, it's interesting that Jesus would say this after what he's just been through that day. I mean, he, chapter 9 begins with him on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, where all the Gentiles are, and he's been ministering there, and some interesting things happen there. Look at chapter 7 and 8. But then it says he got in a boat, and he came over the Sea of Galilee to his home, Capernaum. And when he got to Capernaum, that was the beginning of the craziest day of his life. I mean, it was just one thing after another thing, after another thing, after another thing. And for example, I just jotted down some of these things. He, he immediately meets this paralytic who's brought in by a bunch of friends who want to see if Jesus can do anything to heal him. And Jesus heals him. Then the next thing is he looks over to the side and he sees Matthew, the guy that wrote this particular gospel. He sees Matthew collecting taxes. He says, hey, you tax collector, come and follow me. And so Matthew picks up his stuff and follows Jesus. And apparently while on the, on the, ta on the walk, or as they're walking, apparently Jesus must have said, hey, can we come to your house for lunch? Because the next thing we have in chapter 9 is it's got Matthew serving lunch to all of his buddies, all of his tax collectors, and other people that the, the Pharisees would consider sinners. And so there, and Jesus is right in the middle of them, talking to them, befriending them. And then you have, that's when the Pharisees say, Jesus, what are you doing? You realize who you're talking to? These are tax collectors. These are sinners. And that's when Jesus says, they need God more than anybody. So that's, that's the next thing that happened. Then they left there, and immediately this guy comes up to Jesus and says, my daughter just died. Can't you do something? He says, yeah, I sure can. Take me to her. And on the way that he took, they were taking him to meet his little girl who had died, this lady who has a blood problem, I mean, she's bleeding internally, she comes up behind Jesus and touches the backside of his robe, and she's healed instantly. And Jesus looks around, kind of nods, you know? Yes, you're healed. Then the very next thing that happens is, He's confronted by these two men who are blind and says, can you help us? And Jesus says, absolutely, I can help you here. And then the very next thing that happens is a man come, is brought to him who's filled with demons. And Jesus casts the demon out. Then Jesus says, oh, by the way, fellas, he says, uh, I want you to see that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. That brings us to that. So this day is full. This day is packed. He's going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. But you'll notice he, he wasn't going to A and then to B and then to C and then to D and then to E and the F as though it were totally planned. He was just living life. And as he lived life, he ran into people with needs. And after he met those people with needs, guess what? Instead of continuing down his course, sometimes those needs caused him to redirect, like in Matthew's case. He, he saw Matthew and said, I want you to stop your tax collecting and follow after me. And so he, he brings him in. Where was he planning on going? We don't know, but we know that where he, where he ended up was in Matthew's house. So he changed plans. 
It's in that context when Jesus, when it says about Jesus that he was going through all the cities and the villages, et cetera, et cetera, and he says, you need to know, <laughs> there's a lot to do. There's a lot of people to talk to. There's a lot of people to serve. What he's dealing with here is, what does a missional lifestyle look like? What are the marks of a missional lifestyle? If, if you are serious about following Jesus, it all starts by coming to his throne of grace and literally laying yourself out and saying, I don't have anything to offer you. And, and, and I know sometimes you think, well, I do have things. No, you don't. Everything we could offer God is stained by our sin. We've already messed up royally. And even if you did have some good stuff, if you were to try to outweigh the good with the bad, it, you'd always come up in the wrong way, in a bad way. All those things that you've done in your past, they, they, they happened. And so God says, I, the way you begin this missional lifestyle is you simply come to me on empty, saying, I'm on empty. I'm, I'm over. I'm finished. Help? And that's when Jesus says, listen, that's why I went to the cross, to deal with your issues, your sin. He says, I stepped out of heaven as God, stepping out of heaven, becoming a man, just so I could live life the way you live life, yet without sin. And come to the end of my life, I'm innocent of sin. I'm sinless. He says, and I'm going to literally lay down my life as a sacrificial lamb to pay for your sins. Because God's standard is the wages of sin is death. So he can't ignore the standard. His standard is his holy nature. So he has to deal with it. So he does it himself. He knows that if you and I end up going, living life the way we're doing, we will one day end up dying for our sin. And after that comes the judgment. It's over. It's finished. But Jesus instead loved us enough to step out of heaven and go to the cross. And the Bible is very clear. It says that your sins, my sins, were all placed on him on this cross. And he died. And right before he died, he says... The debt is now paid in full to tell us die. He died. Three days later, he came back from the dead. And he says, I'm alive. I've been resurrected from the dead. And now I offer you life that's full of forgiveness. And I offer you a resurrected life full of life and purpose. He says, but I'm not going to force it on you. He says, so I offer it to you as a gift. Will you receive the grace of God? that enables you literally to receive this eternity, this eternal life. See, if you've never done that, trying to follow Jesus in a missional lifestyle is going to frustrate you. There's too many of us that have gone through the motions and tried to do the best we can, but we always come up short. So it's got to start here. He's speaking primarily to his disciples that he's already called and said, I want you to come and follow after me. And he's been spending three and a half years with them, teaching them, talking to them, telling them what he's about to do. So that's where it comes down to. It starts there. If you're here today and you've not humbled yourself before God and said, God, I can't fix my life. I am broken. I'm a sinner. If you've not done that yet, you need to do that. And you need to simply receive the gift of grace and mercy that he offers, which results in eternal life, purpose for living. When you do that, then, then everything changes. The spirit in you that is dead at birth because of our sin comes to life and now enjoys intimacy with the spirit of God who comes and takes up residence in us. That's what the Bible teaches that the born-again experience is all about, is that he comes to live inside of you. Well, that can be yours. But it, it won't happen until you finally come to the end of yourself first. Like every one of us who've done that has had to do that. I did that. I'm, as a former atheist, I had to humble myself big time because I could not believe there was a God. I rejected the whole notion. But I finally had to come to that point where I said, it's possible, as much as I hate to say it. But I had to confess that I'm a sinner because no doubt, even atheists sin. And when I did that, then I began to see what, what Jesus did. That's where you have to come first. In fact, before we go any further, maybe you're hearing, this, maybe this, the light bulb just come on and it dawned, it's dawning on you, this is what I need to do. I've not, never done this, I need to do it. Well, then simply just whisper a prayer to God that says, I'm ready, I'm broken, I've sinned against you. God, please heal me. You went to the cross 
to pay for my sins. I believe that now. And I accept the gift of grace that you offer me so that I can be born again. That's all you need to do. I can't do it for you. Your wife can't do it for you either. Neither your parents can't do it for you. You have to do that. Will you do it? Let's just take a moment and pray right now. If you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes. If you're ready to pray that way, it's not so much the words as it is the heart. Why don't you just whisper in your heart? If you're ready, whisper from your heart to God Almighty. Tell Him, I'm ready. Tell Him that you are a sinner, that you want your life changed. You need forgiveness. Tell Him that you now believe that Jesus died for you on that cross and that He's alive and offering you a gift and you accept that gift. Just tell Him, I accept that gift and I give you back what's left of my life. Father, you heard that, the prayers that just went up to you. I'm asking, Lord, that throughout the, the course of this service that you'll speak to them directly about what that will mean and how that will look as they move forward. Please, God, seal their commitment today with your spirit. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you did just pray that prayer, you need to know it happened. How can I assure you that? Because that's what God says he's going to do. And God never lies. He always follows through on what he said he'll do. So just get ready. And he'll stir it up. And does that mean you'll never feel guilty again? No, because you're going to sin again. And when you do, you thought you used to feel guilty. Oh, this is the worst. When, when a Christian feels guilty, it's awful. Because he will torment you until you turn back to him. Because he's saying you're settling for so much less when you tolerate sin in your own life. He says, but I'll forgive you if you'll confess. I'll cleanse you completely if you'll turn to me honestly. Now, th that brings me to the marks of a missional person. What are they? And let's just go through this passage again. Number one, the first mark. Missional people are on assignment. Missional people are on assignment. Look at the very first verse again, verse 35. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages. Now, remember, this came right after all of that, that litany of things that he was doing, going from one place to another place to another place, and then he sums it all up by saying, Jesus was going through all, through all the cities and the villages. What's he talking about here? He's saying, as you live life, you're on assignment. You don't wait for God to send you something in the mail that says, oh, here's your assignment for this week. No, you live life. You go to work. You go to school. You go home. You go shopping. You do all the things that you would normally do. But instead of just doing those things, you've always got an eye open to what's God up to right here? And how am I supposed to fit into this? That's what this is about. Living missionally means that you know you're always on assignment. You don't just sign up for a week and then that's it for the rest of the 51 weeks of the year. No, you're always on assignment. This was perfectly demonstrated by Jesus. So, and under each one of these points, I've given you a question. This is more for you to evaluate. After, when, when you're moving missionally, this is to help you stay on top of things. But the first question there is this. Did you know that you're already on assignment? Did you know it? If you did, then you want to start asking a few other questions. But that's where you start here. Then, number two. Missional people are intentional. Missional people are intentional. They, it, it doesn't just happen. They know why they're there, and they begin to move in that direction. Look at verse 35 again. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and the villages, doing three things. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. When Jesus was living missionally on this earth, he wasn't just wandering from place to place, waiting for somebody to say, hey, we got a mission project over here for you, Jesus. No, he went with the intent of doing one of these three things, looking for that open door. And, and the, th the three things, teaching, proclaiming the gospel, and healing is what he did here. Well, how does that apply to us? I mean, Jesus is God, so Jesus can do anything. He can heal any disease. You can't. But God can, and still does, as you heard just a few moments ago. He does. But how does this apply to us principally as, as a missional pe person. Well, it says that he went through the synagogues, teaching in the synagogues. What does that mean? He's teaching the word of God. He's taking the truth and laying it all out and passing it on to others. He's investing in others. Here's the, here's the, uh, the 21st century word that you might want to apply here, mentoring. 
There are so many things that God has taught you personally about himself, about his ways, about relating to others, that God wants you to pour it out into somebody else's life that you see is struggling with those issues. So to live missionally means that you've got your eyes open for people that you could just share with what you've learned. It's that simple. That's the teaching part. And then, of course, and it says that he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom too, which is, what is that? That's really witnessing. That's you being an, an eyewitness to how God can change a person's life. And the one to start with is yourself. So you're, when you're on mission, you're looking for somebody that you can talk to about what happened to you. God has changed your life if you've invited Christ into your life. Okay, well, how did that happen? When did it happen? Where did it happen? How, how much of a change has it made in your life? I mean, that's, that's it. If you're on mission, you're looking for people to invest your life into, and you're looking to find somebody who will hear you talk about how God has transformed your life. That's what he's doing. And then the, the, the last one is the healing. Jesus went about healing every kind of disease, it says, and every kind of sickness. How, how does that apply to us? Well, I don't have to tell you. I mean, first and foremost, we have so many people in the medical profession in our church that they're all about healing. I mean, why do they do what they do? Because they want to help a person who's sick. But if we were to condense it down to maybe another phrase that might be easier understood and more transferable, how about... Healing might be just the meeting of needs. Because when you're healing somebody, you are definitely meeting a need. But it goes far beyond that. And, and of course, and when you look and see what Jesus did, how many times did he break the bread and the fishes and distribute them and say, hey, I'm preparing dinner for you all tonight. I mean, he was meeting needs. That's what Jesus did. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to be looking for opportunities literally to invest our life into others. We need to be looking for opportunities to talk to people about our story and how God changed us. We need to look for opportunities to provide needs. Always. And, and, and when I say we, I mean every one of us. We can't just be waiting for the church to come up with some ideas like we did this past week. I mean, we're going to do some of those things, but primarily to introduce people who have never done it before. If you've already done it, you already know what to do. But but are you personally looking out to be very focused here? I mean, a missional person is intentional. So there's a question down there. How has God used you today? I mean, you can use your influence. To, you can pour your life into somebody's life. You, even in the few minutes that you were here before service started, you, you had people here you could talk to. While you're in the car driving here, you could pour your life into somebody there. You could share your story. I mean, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But every day we ought to be asking the question, how did God use me today? And that brings me to number three, the third mark. A missional person is compassionate. Missional people are compassionate. That means you do allow yourself to feel. You know, sometimes people will give you the counsel, well, you can't allow yourself to get sucked into this and, and be personally involved. I, I would disagree. I mean, you, you can't help it. When you invest yourself in somebody's life, you can't help but begin to feel. That's what happened here. Look at to verse 36. This is Jesus, remember? Jesus, God in the flesh. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Here, Jesus literally kind of put his feet in their shoes and saw what they're going through and and he understood it. He felt it. Remember, he never sinned. But he has been, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way we've, we've ever are tempted, yet without sin. It's because of that he's able to feel compassion for you and me. Now, there's two words here that are really important. If, if, for you to really feel for somebody and to kind of begin to develop compassion, these are two words that really need to be a part of how you look and how you see people. The first word was that word dis distressed, where he says they were distressed and dispirited with like sheep. The word distressed is a word that means bewildered, confused, harassed, worn out, bullied. Do you ever run into people like that? God says, I want you to feel compassion toward them. Rather than always being there saying, well, let's just fix this problem. You need to feel for them first and realize, hey, they're going through the worst time of their life. They feel so helpless, there's not a thing they can do to change this course. That, that doesn't mean it doesn't lead to solutions. 
But God's saying, I want you to have a heart for people. I don't want this to become mechanical, where you just do it so that you can put up on a big old chart. Well, last week we fed so many people, and this week we healed so many people, and this week we shared the gospel so many times. Once it becomes so mechanical that there's no heart in it, then you're doing it for you and not for God. God says, I want you to do far more than you could ever plan to do. That's what he's talking about here. And then there's that other word, the word dispirited. Dispirited means to be defenseless, dejected, scattered, alone, isolated, helpless. To feel like there's nobody there who cares. That's what that is. God says, I want you to feel compassion because you're surrounded by people who feel that way. It may not be true. They may be surrounded by people, but they just love, don't let them in. And that may be their problem. But rather than go in there to fix their problem first, start to feel a little bit. Because you'll be much more understanding in the way that you prescribe the solution or the cure. So I got a question down there. Is your heart softer today than it was yesterday? Number four, the fourth mark of a missional person Missional people are motivated by the great need. Missional people are motivated by the great need. One of the things I hope that you would see when you went out on these mission projects is that there is a great need. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. But that's why we wanted to do what we did so you would see it. Look, look at verse 38 again. Verse, uh, oh no, back at verse 37. It says, Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And, of course, and in light of all that they've just gone through, I mean, we're, we're talking about a band of 12 going through, catching that boat uh, into Capernaum and then running into all these. It, it should become obvious there's so much need. And, and it's just one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing, and there's nonstop. And that's Jesus' way of using that as an example. He says, listen, <laughs> you saw how busy we were? Well, there's... Let's multiply it a hundredfold. That's, there's that many needs out there. He says, I want you to see the great need, and it's just us, fellas. The 12 disciples, it's just us. He says, we need some help. When you realize that there are needs not being met that you could meet, you come to the realization that you need help, but you don't wait until you get help. You immediately say, well, let me do what I can until we get help. It motivates you. And then, of course, then you'll be blessed beyond measure when you choose to be a part of something like that we just did, whether you get help or not. I mean, there were some of you that just showed up at these events. You didn't have anybody prodding, pushing you. You just felt like, I need to do something because there's such a need. You did, and you're the one that came away, you came away from that blessed. That's what we're talking about here. Missional people are motivated by the great need. There is a question. The question is, are you willing to do what you can? Not are you willing to do what everybody else is going to do, but are you willing to do what you can? Number five, missional people are prayer warriors. They're prayer warriors. It's interesting what Jesus said these fellows needed to do. I mean, they, he just pointed out the great need, but what does he say? Verse 38, therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to do something. That's his way of saying, I need you to pray. I know, you're, you're thinking, no, I've got to go get my friends. I've got to find other people who can help with this tremendous need. We're going to get a bunch of people to come. That's part of the solution, but he says, no. First, I want you to beseech the Lord of the harvest, the one that has opened your eyes to the great need. He says, I want you to pray. I want you to be a prayer warrior because I can tear down walls that you could never. I can open up doors that you could never. I can offer possibilities for you that aren't totally impossible apart from me. This is God's way of saying, listen, I want you to spend time on your knees, on your face before me, admitting that you're here to serve me. Because you can get caught up in all the do's, the to-do's, and forget about him. We, we live for him. It pleases him when we live for him. And so that's why God has the prerogative. He can say, okay, then enough of that. But God, there's so much need. I still want you over here. It's sort of like I'm in the middle of cutting green beans at the Salvation Army for three hours, cutting green beans and putting them over there, and I'm starting to feel it all on my shoulder. And, and this guy walks up to me and says, listen, I need to get you to do something else. And I'm thinking, 
praise God, I get to stop. <laughs> and so he brings me over, and what does he do? He says, it's hot, we just pulled it out of the stove, but you need to debone all this chicken. <laughs> what? But that was his call, because I was just there to serve. And he could do anything he wanted. He could tell me to do it, and I was willing to do it. And I learned creative ways to separate meat from bones, <laughs> you know? That's what we're talking about here. Uh, are we in tune with the living God who has created us for himself? Are we willing to listen to him when he says, I want you to do this? And then in the middle of this, are we willing to listen to him when he says, come here, over here? I mean, he did it many, in the book of Acts. You see incidents like that all the time. I, I mean, it's just Philip is in the midst of a big revival. People everywhere are coming into Christ, and God says, all right, go down to Gaza, where you're just going to run into one person. But God, I don't want to leave all these people who now are ready to trust Christ. No, he says, no, you go anyway. Why would he do that? That's his call. That's why we have to stay on our faces before God in prayer, never presuming that we know better than God. We need to be willing to turn on a dime the moment God says turn on a dime. Even if you laid out the best plans, we need to be willing to turn on a dime when God says, I know the plans look better, but here's what I want you to do. That's, that's biblical, missional living. And then that brings me to, that, the question under that too, by the way, is did you pray today about your assignment? Not the final mark of a mission, a missional person. Missional people are available and listening for further instructions. In other words, they're always asking the question, what's next? What's next? But in a ready mode. It's sort of like, I mean, how many of you have ever watched, you know, when you see, watch the Olympics, you, you watch the field and track where they're running the 100. Have you seen that? You know, that's the fastest people on the earth. They run the 100, and what they do is they put these blocks there in the middle of their track, and then when, it, when, they, when it's about that time, they walk over to the blocks, they make sure they're sturdy, and then they'll get down in the tracks, you know, make sure that it's lined up. They'll, they'll adjust, you know, the length of it so it fits their, their foot perfectly. Then eventually they go down on their knees, you know, and they're, they're just kind of resting. So the guy will say, on your mark. And so that means they get about in this position. Then they say, get set. And when they say, get set, then they put their hands down where it is, and they pop up, you know. And then when they pop, they're waiting for the gun. The next thing, well, what he's talking about is, I want you to be in the set position. A missional person is already down, already done what he can do to make sure he's as efficient and productive as he can be. But God has said, set. You're up, and, the, and you're looking. And the moment he shoots the gun or says, go, you know where you're going. When, but until that time, you're looking around. Where's that one person I can share a witness to? Where's that one person I can pour my life into? Where's that one person I can provide a need for? You're looking. And then when you spot it, you just mark it, nail it down. The moment you see that, you got your eyes there, you begin to think about how you could minister in that capability. You're, you're, you're looking at it, then, then you hear the gun shot. Bam, and you go, and you do it. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about a missional lifestyle that says, all right, God, whenever, whatever. No, he wants you down on the track, ready to go. So the question at the very bottom is this. Are you looking for a need to meet? Or are you just waiting until it just stumbles on you? God wants us to be missional people. Missional. He wants us to live to serve him. And how do you do that? By serving others. That's why it's couched. When Jesus is asked, what are the greatest commandments? He says, well, love the Lord your God with everything. But then he says, but also love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what do you do with yourself? Well, if you have a need, you seek to meet that need. You take care of that need. And that's basically what he's saying here. He says, I want you to love me first and foremost and, and attribute to me the reason you're doing this. But at the same time, I want you to live life looking for ways to minister to people. Most of all, he wants you to lead them to him. But sometimes you have to help and feed a person first before they'll listen because they can't hear a thing you say is when they're starving. Missional living means that you really care about people. And you do what you can, knowing that you can't do everything. And sometimes what you try to do fails. That doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you're obedient. You do what God tells you to do and then leave the results to him. Church, I'm so proud of you. You're a missional body of believers. But, but we've just tasted of what that is like. Let's go further. All right?